If you've been keeping up with Ska in recent years, then you probably know that there is a very long and very annoying debate centering one of the most successful and largest bands that have come from that scene, and that is Streetlight Manifesto. You honestly can't even go into a Ska group or on the Ska Reddit without seeing some form of post asking if Streetlight Manifesto is a Ska band or not. And to a lot of people outside of the Ska scene, that's a simple question. Yes, Streetlight Manifesto is a Ska band. They have horns, they play with Ska bands, and their fans all like Ska. Horns behind punk rock is ska music, right? Not exactly. The answer to if Streetlight Manifesto is a ska band has been on my mind for a while, and to squash this debate, I decided to compile all of my thoughts on not only if that's a ska band or not, but what really defines a band being a ska band or any band belonging to any genre. Although quick note, this definitely will not squash anything because people just love to argue online and this is just my thoughts and what makes the most sense to me. So if you're already typing up a storm of an essay in the comments explaining why they are or aren't a ska band, I probably don't care and won't read it so you can just save the energy. But before we get started I want to mention that I am very new to the video essay thing and it is not easy making these things. In fact it's a lot of hard work and I have a lot of respect for people who edit these things on the regular. However this is a thing I really want to dive deeper into so if you're digging this please show me by hitting that like and maybe subscribing if you're new and make sure that you're following me on all of my other social medias listed. And check out my Patreon too. Patreon is a cool place that allows me to make money by being a content creator because we live in a society in which you need to pay money to be alive and if I can't afford to do that then I cannot dedicate time to making content so seriously a big thank you to everyone over on Patreon who give me the stability I otherwise would not have. That being said, let's dive into this essay. I feel like the most logical way to open up this debate is defining what ska music is. And the best way to do that is describing where ska came from in the first place. Because believe it or not, a lot of people think ska is a quirky, gimmicky genre that originated in California. Like it's really funny to me, people think that these suburban marching band kids from Orange County just decided to add horns to pop punk music in the 90s and then ska music was born. But ska music actually has this very rich history that dates back about 50 to 60 years. Now quick disclaimer, this video is not the history of ska, I am not going into all of the deep nuances of the genre, I am simply explaining what I think is important that makes the connection of if Streetlight Manifesto is a ska band or not. So let's go back to the early 1960s where Jamaica had just gained independence from England and this country has this newfound identity going alongside its independence. A lot of things happened in the years prior which led to the perfect setup for the formation of ska. Well first off, Jamaica already had its own form of folk music called Minto, and Minto was very similar to another Afro-Caribbean genre many people are familiar with, and that's Calypso. Now there is one main difference between Minto and Calypso, and that is its rhythm. In fact, it's not even the rhythm that's different, it's just where the rhythm starts. But to explain this better, I'm just going to quote part of a paper that my friend Woody wrote when he was studying percussion at the University of Tampa. He states, stylistically, Minto places a heavy emphasis on the upbeat in a 3-beat 16th note pattern, E and and, uh, the rhythm, shown in figure 1, is often mistaken for a Trinidadian Calypso pattern, shown in figure 2. But while these patterns have a similar feel, the Minto pattern is offset from the Calypso pattern by a single 16th note. This rhythm is all over traditional ska, like literally it's everywhere, and I want to play an example using Toots and the Maytals' Pressure Drop. So it's very important to listen to the guitar rhythm in this. E and a one, E and a two, E and a three, E and a E and a one, E and a two, E and a E and a E and a one. E and a E and a E and a E and a one, E and a E and a E and a E and a. A lot of people think that horns and guitars playing offbeats is the big determining factor of ska, but that's actually not true at all. A lot of traditional ska did not have that much horns, and the Afro-Caribbean rhythm that defines ska uses a lot of syncopation, which is just fancy music theory jargon for utilizing offbeats. Now I say it utilizes syncopation rather than just saying it is offbeats, because not everything that has offbeats is ska music. In the same sense that not everything that has horns is ska music. Now the thing about ska music that makes it very particular is that it doesn't all have roots in only Afro-Caribbean music. Its roots in Minto and Calypso are very important, but it's equally as important as its roots in American music. That's right, American music. During the 1950s, a lot of American music made its way over to the island of Jamaica, 
whether it was through radio signals from cities like Miami and New Orleans, or it was just through the fascination of acquiring American music, specifically African American music like rhythm and blues, rock and roll, and jazz. Now this is very important because these American influences added a lot to the genre. Ellie Lewis are uh, Professor Long here, uh, Louis Jordan, you know, those kind of beat. We tried to imitate it. It didn't turn out that way. So we decided to keep this as our own type. That's how that can come in. Styling like those was really rhythm and blues. What we did to this rhythm and blues is like you'll be doing One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But the, the, the scanner we change it to one, two, two. And then it's more two, four, two, four, instead of one. For the less horn-oriented music, which was most ska music at the time, it was very much formulated like pop music of the time. And for more jazz-leaning ska, like the Scottalites, that stuff was structured, well, more like jazz music. It had a head, and then they would play solos over the same head section, and then they would take it back to the head and finish out the song, much like jazz standards. Look at the instrumentation of Scott, you can very much see it was copying all of the instrumentation of the popular American music at the time. Guitar, bass, drums, keys, horns, that's all the instrumentation makeup of jazz, rock and roll, and rhythm and blues. So how was ska music created? Well, Jamaicans basically took this music that they were fascinated with and mixed it with what they knew and what was their own, and that's how it was created. That's how ska was formed. So, is Streetlight Manifesto a ska band? Do they sound like Jamaican Minto mixed with the popular American music of the 1950s? Well, of course they don't. But does that make them not a ska band? I wouldn't go too far to say that does not make them a ska band yet, because if you're going by that definition, by the definition of when ska first formed, then the specials isn't a ska band, neither are the toasters, neither is Real Big Fish, neither is Less Than Jake, neither is Mustard Plug, and a lot of ska elitists will say that most of the bands I listed aren't real ska bands, and to ska elitists, I say, nobody cares what you have to say. And the next thing I want to talk about in this video that basically shoots down any ska elitists is that music evolves. I think the arguments of newer ska isn't real ska, ska has to sound exactly the way it did 60 years ago. It's such a weird and backwards argument. Humans aren't like that. Humans change over time. And just like humans changing over time based off of the interactions they make in their life, music works the same exact way. A ska band in 2019 is going to have different things impacting their life than ska musicians of the 1960s. You don't, how can you expect the music to sound exactly the same? The music in itself is a hybrid of like five different genres. So like, I don't understand why they think hybriding ska music with other genres is such a taboo that makes it nothing like what ska is. But this video isn't roasting ska, lead us on how wrong they are. This video is on if Strugalai Manifesto is a ska band or not. So let's continue. The evolution of music is just very, very natural, and no one genre ever sounds exactly the same throughout all of its duration. In fact, the only genres you can name that sounded exactly the same from birth to death is like New Jack Swing or Dubstep, which are two genres that were very short-lived. Now let's take a look at orchestral music. Look at the music of Bach, who died a quarter of a millennia ago. His music is very formulaic, it's very safe, it feels like a puzzle that's already put together and you're just looking at it and it's already just very nice. It was basically pop music for its time. It didn't challenge the ears too much, it was always resolving nicely. Now compare that to Igor Stravinsky, a composer who died just a little under 50 years ago. Now his music is extremely different. It has a much dynamic contrast, it utilizes a lot more dissonance in its writing. In fact, everything was so unconventional to the style of music that when the Rite of Spring first premiered, people actually booted off stage because it sounded so not normal to what the genre expected. 
people were actually really furious on how he approached writing for an orchestra, the same way people are really furious with how newer ska bands write music and call it ska. But let's take a look at another genre that has evolved very much over time, and that's jazz music. If you take the New Orleans Dixieland jazz sound and compare that to Snarky Puppy, you will notice that those sound extremely different. But to people who study jazz and play jazz, they consider both of those as jazz. So I wonder why people consider both of those jazz even though they sound way more different than traditional ska and ska punk sound. I think part of it is that jazz musicians really pride in pushing the boundaries and making things sound different. Now throughout my adventures of music school, I have learned that there are jazz elitists out there who refuse to call snarky puppy jazz, and just like ska elitists, I think y'all are ridiculous. But I think there is a very clear common connection between the early jazz of like Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, and Duke Ellington with later jazz like Snarky Puppy, Robert Glasper, and etc. And that's culture. That's right, part three of this video for me is going to be talking about culture because I think culture is honestly the biggest part of defining genres. And a great example of culture being a part of music I want to use is hip hop. Now hip hop has to be the largest genre that has had the latest start in common American culture. And because of that, it's very easy to study where it came from and why it happened. It formed out of the Bronx in New York City and it wasn't just a type of music, it was the culture of the people there. The people interacting with each other and forming the fashion, forming the dance, forming the art, forming everything about it is kind of what caused the genre to take off the way it did. Hip-hop was more than just people speaking poetry rhythmically over a beat, it was an entire way of life. Like seriously, it was a complete reflection of the African-American urban lifestyle, specifically those living in New York. A teenager named Africa Bambada started the Zulu Nation at the Bronx River Projects. It was a new type of gang which focused in on music and dance. Neighborhood boys were called crews, and they challenged each other in wild acrobatic feats called breakdancing. The first youth culture since the 60s put a premium on individual imagination, and the hip-hop generation was born. Hip-hop is a culture based on four foundational elements. DJing, MCing, or rap, graffiti, and breakdancing. People use the terms interchangeably, rap with hip-hop, whereas hip-hop is the bigger culture. Rap is something you do. Hip-hop is something you live. But as time went on and the culture started growing more and then more generations of the culture has started forming, the music obviously started changing. Now hip hop started becoming more commercial throughout the 80s and so you started seeing the underground scene form while the few artists like Run DMC broke into the mainstream during the 80s. And then a bunch started happening with you know the whole East Coast West Coast thing which again this is a ska channel I'm not really talking about hip hop like that. But the big takeaway I want to get with that is in the 90s when N.W.A. basically broke out and made gangster rap into a well-known thing. And at this point, it's very far removed where you have N.W.A. making the gangster rap sound and comparing that to Rapper's Delight. It's just not comparable. Early hip hop music was still very funky. It had a lot to do with like the dance party thing. But at this point in the 90s, hip hop had already become so large, it just was not only that. And at that point, the genre had only just begun. From there, the genre only grew bigger and bigger, becoming more commercial and more materialistic, while the underground kept growing in its own regard. And then you saw the introduction of the internet as we know it today. So hip hop in 2019 is completely different than hip hop in 1979. You can listen to contemporary hip hop artists like 21 Savage and compare that to like early hip hop like Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang, and you can see that they sound completely different. But despite them being both completely different in lyrical content and the structure of the songs and the beat and the production and absolutely every single thing, it's still considered hip hop by society standards. And that's because hip hop culture today has changed from hip hop culture in 1979. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. You see, I am 
Gone and they real blingy bling. Draco make you do the chicken head like chingy ching. Walking Neiman Marcus and I spend a life 50 50. Please proceed with caution shooters, they be right with me. 21. Bad bitch, cute face, and some nice titties. Send it 500 on the Cultures and music change and that's completely normal, and to expect it to stay exactly the same again is just very ridiculous. So when you look at how much these genres have changed over time, why is it such a ridiculous notion that ska music can't change over time? Applying this to ska, it's very very clear the path that the ska culture has taken over time. It started in Jamaica and it kept doing its own thing in Jamaica, but as many Jamaicans immigrated to England in the 60s and 70s, they started integrating with the music cultures of England and basically those mixed together and created the second wave of ska. And with this new wave came a whole new sound because again you had a whole new generation with a whole new type of influences into their music changing the culture. And this shift in the culture and how ska is sounding in that day and age does not discredit any of the original ska music. It's not like adding content to one of them takes away from the other. It's not like, you know, giving one person human rights takes away others human rights, though there are idiots who agree with that just like there are idiots who are elitist about genres and agree with that. But anyway, as the second wave grew really large and gained lots of commercial success in England, its influence started making its way to America. Bands like the Toasters started dominating this two-tone sound in America, and just like the original formation of Ska and the two-tone thing, American bands started mixing their American music of the time with Ska music, creating the third wave sound of Ska Punk. The Mighty Mighty Bostons and Operation Ivy are two very popular ska punk bands who basically were one of the first to create the mix between the punk and hardcore punk sound with ska music. But those bands fundamentally were involved with the, both the culture of ska music and the culture of punk, which is how that hybrid happened. And the same exact thing in America happened that happened in Jamaica years prior. Jamaicans mixed together Mento with American genres like jazz and rhythm and blues and etc etc, while these American bands started mixing together this ska sound with the punk music that they knew and that created its own culture mixed together. And then you saw an explosion in the popularity of that culture, and then the third wave of ska happened and now everyone knows ska is a genre in America. Now let's fast forward to 2002. Streetlight Manifesto had formed and started playing its first shows. Is Streetlight Manifesto a ska band? If you're going to compare them to the Scottalites or Toots and the Mantels or any other early ska artists, then no, they don't sound anything like that. But also, Snarky Puppy sounds nothing like early jazz, nor does 21 Savage sound like anything like early hip hop, or nor does Igor Stravinsky sound like any early classical music. And I really hope y'all can see that music evolves and that is not different to ska music at all. Shreela Manifesto is just a ska band that formed later down the path than most other ska bands that we know. By the time they formed, there was so much influence from not only so many different waves of ska music, but so many other genres outside of ska, so they just mixed it all together and created their own unique sound, but I think fundamentally it's still ska. And if you really think the formation of Streetlight Manifesto does not come from ska backgrounds, literally Thomas used to play in a ska band called Catch-22, and the horns used to be part of a New Jersey ska band called One Cool Guy. So like, literally they both come from backgrounds in ska music. And I really think that's the biggest thing that makes a band part of a genre or not, and it kind of explains a lot of those bands that seem like outliers but still fit in the genre, or vice versa. There's a lot of bands that you would think would fit in the genre, but they just don't, like Pain and Just Friends. Like, Literally, they just sound like bands in kind of the punk vein of things that have horns, but they really don't sound anything like ska. Which makes a lot of sense because both of them don't have a lot of influence in ska at all, and both of them just didn't come from a ska scene. Now, I want to acknowledge that Streetlight Manifesto has a lot of influences. All of their music isn't 100% influenced by ska, but I mean, that's literally okay. Not every single band has to have all of their influences derived from one sound. I mean, ska music was created by mixing together influences from a bunch of different genres, so I think it's really, really hypocritical when ska leaders say that you have to sound exactly like only ska bands to be a ska band. And Sri Lanka Manifesto isn't the only ska band to push the boundaries on what they can sound like like this. Another great example is the Flaming Tsunamis, a ska core band out of Connecticut. Now they weren't the first ska core band, but they were definitely one of the biggest ska core bands. They took a lot of influence from hardcore and metalcore and mixed that with ska music to create this subgenre. I think ska core is different enough where you can really classify it as its own genre, but its cultural influences come from other larger genres that already exist, hence it being a subgenre.
And like the subgenre of ska core makes a lot of sense because there is like a ska core scene that has formed around that sound and that sound is very specific. But people really like making up subgenres for Streetlight Manifesto that literally make zero sense and they just look like a clown when they're describing it. Like seriously, Streetlight Manifesto is a jazz punk band. I've seen that so much and you can call something jazz punk but it doesn't really make it a real genre. Streetlight Manifesto has never called themselves jazz punk and there has never been a large influential and definitive jazz punk scene. You can go on Wikipedia and look up jazz punk and there kind of is a page for it, but like all the bands they list sound nothing like Streetlight Manifesto and it's it's just very vague at what jazz punk really even is. I've also seen things like thrash, jazz, horncore, I don't, I don't even know. People really love throwing together random words that have something to do with being a punk band with horns and then hoping that that's the new genre that can be coined for Streetlight Manifesto. Like get off Facebook, you're you're not coining a new genre, you're not gonna get that credit, it's Streetlight's a ska band, I'm sorry. Now before I start wrapping this video up, there is something I do want to bring up. Earlier Streetlight does have aspects of ska musically, as well as origins in the ska scene and ska culture. But when you're looking at their later releases, yes, it is very much straying away from that sound and it starts going into its own thing. But I think what they do is they take their original sound from Everything Goes Numb and they start honing in on what makes it unique rather than just creating a whole new sound altogether. Like you can play old Streetlight Manifesto and new Streetlight Manifesto and hear it coherently as the same band and the same sound. And I think a good way of describing this very honed in specific Streetlight Manifesto sound that does have roots in the ska sound and ska culture, and that is with adjacency, a term that the emos are very familiar with. Emo is a very expansive genre. You can have two bands like The Promise Ring and American Football and they're both classified as emo bands. Even though one sounds very twinkly, very dreamy, very jazz-like, and the other one sounds much more riffy like alternative rock from the 90s, they're still both considered emo. And if you go on the emo reddit, you can find a bunch of clowns arguing over what is and isn't real emo the same way you can find clowns arguing over what is and isn't real ska. Because how dare bands do things that are different. But anyway, let's talk about this term of adjacency. Now I hear this term a lot, emo adjacent. Well, what does that even mean? It means that there's a band that is definitely considered in the emo scene, even though their music style sounds a lot different. Like it doesn't sound different in the sense that it's a whole different genre. It still fits in that aesthetic of emo, but it just doesn't fit the conventional style of emo bands. A great example is Roswell Kid. That's a band that slapped everyone in the face in a time when all emo was just really twinkly Midwest guitar sounds and they had the fuzz guitars and this really, really rock and roll vibe. If Roswell Kid made an interview and they said their two biggest influences were Weezer and Iron Maiden, I believe it because they shred like Iron Maiden in their songs, but their songs sound a lot like Weezer. But overall, they're still fitting in the emo scene. And to me, if I had to pick one word to describe their sound, it is emo. And the same thing can be said for Streetlight Manifesto with ska music. A lot of people will say that they're thrash jazz, but before I consider them in jazz or thrash, I would definitely consider them in the ska bubble first. There's not a single genre I can think of that fits their sound any better than just saying they're a ska band. And at best, they're a ska band, and at worst, they're ska adjacent, and they still seek that inspiration from ska. And that's the Scott Network seal of approval on whether Streetlight Manifesto is a ska band or not. But did this video earn your seal of ska approval on if they're a ska band or not? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching this video essay. If you like what you heard, please give a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. And if you're not following me on all of my social medias, those are listed in the description below. And a big thank you to every single person who is supporting this channel on Patreon. Y'all are the lifeline of this channel. And let me know what type of topics you want me to cover in Punk Rock Music Theory episode number three. I can do a full analysis of a song. I can talk more about concept things like this. I can talk about music theory terms and how they apply to punk rock and ska music. Literally, it can be anything. So let me know in the comments below. And I'll see y'all next time.